So uh, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, climate describes a system with a set of possible outcomes, not unlike roulette. And uh, so when we're doing these studies, a lot of times we end up talking about average outcomes rather than individual events that might uh, be resolved from those systems. And um, how we view the outcomes depends on how we place our bets. <laughs> and how we place our bets with regards to fire uh, often involves what we're doing with the fuels. So if we have an understory fire regime like we have in a lot of, of uh, parts of the Sierras, for example, uh, fire suppression over the 20th century and land use changes have excluded fire from parts of the landscape long enough that the vegetation is much more dense than it was 100 or 150 years ago. And that means that the fires burn with uh, greater intensity. So the hotter fires in a system that's not adapted to it. And so we have less frequent than we used to have, but, but more intense. And it has a, a variety of impacts on ecosystems and on um, um, air pollution emissions and on property risks, residential property risks uh, in the wildland urban interface. Um, so one, another way that we place our bets is where we build and how we build our structures. Uh, in the wildland urban interface. So you can see um, in the lower left a very scenic home uh, that probably has a high fire risk. And you, on the right, you have communities uh, where the fire can penetrate into subdivisions without any trouble. And the top there is an example of, of a built in vulnerability where ashes and burning embers can get carried into uh, places that, where they subsequently uh, cause a house to burn down after the fire crews have left and the uh, vegetation is no longer burning in the surrounding areas. Um, in terms of, of ecosystem effects, so if we treat fuels, uh, thinning, so the left is showing pretreatment and the right is showing post-treatment in areas where we, that historically had these frequent low intensity fire regimes, um, you make it more robust to fire. So on the right there uh, is an area that burned through in the station fire, and it didn't have it that big of an impact on the trees. It was mostly a surface fuel fire. Here's an example not from California, but on the left and on the right are areas within the same fire, uh, the Rodeo Chetiskai fire in 2002, but the left was thin and the right wasn't. So you can see the impact on vegetation. So these are all different ways that we can place our bets, and here's an example of consequences for an unlucky landowner who didn't score. Um, and uh, another impact that we've mentioned a few times today is air pollution. The 2003 uh, October wildfires in San Diego are on the bottom left corner there. Uh, you can see satellite image of the smoke uh, mostly being carried out to sea, but I, I know from personal experience it wasn't very much fun to be here in San Diego uh, downwind of that um, in 2003. And 2008, we had uh, a lot of lightning ignited fires. It wasn't really severe drought conditions. It wasn't um, necessarily really huge fires. There were just so many of them. And one of the biggest sources of, of interannual variability in California is uh, clusters of lightning strikes like that. 1987, 2003 in Northern California, the biggest um, fire years in the Sierras because of clustered lightning strikes and how they interact with climate, how climate sets up the fuels. So all of these things are important for thinking about how we would define um, an extreme event in wildfire. So I said uh, climate is, you know, describing a word we use to describe a system and then the events or extreme events are you know, just one realization of that, whether it's a historical observation or a projection for the future, just a realization. So this is sort of a general schematic of what we're looking at when we think about modeling uh, effects of climate change on fire in California. So we have greenhouse gas emissions up to the present time and then projected into the future, different scenarios for those that shape how uh, uh, the they are going to affect how the climate responds uh, 
And then we have different climate models with different climate sensitivities, so more or less warming for the same level of emissions, and interacting with things like uh, scenarios for population growth and development, and it's, so the spatial footprint and the amount of population growth and how that affects the fuels and the values at risk and where people could be exposed to risks. And then uh, the fire regime itself is responding to changes in vegetation, changes in development, changes in climate. Um, that, and then each of these in turn affects um, ecosystem changes, residential property risk, wildfire emissions, and, and other impacts as well. But those are the, the ones that we've been focusing on here. Um, fire is strongly affected by climate. Um, and here's an ex uh, a negative example. So in ecosystems like what you see there burning in the background, grass and shrub <coughs> in the sort of dry interior basins in particular, there's not any significant correlation with temperature. Because these are places that are, are sort of sparsely fueled. And so what they really rely on is antecedent year's moisture to, to, to give you a continuous fuel layer. And making it a little bit hotter, or even a lot hotter, in a place that's already hot and dry in the, in the summer doesn't really change uh, the fire risks that much historically. Now, projecting forward, if it dries out enough, then you have less fuel. You can actually get reductions in fire in, in an ecosystem like that. Um, conversely, in our forest ecosystems, they tend, the number of large forest fires on the vertical axis and the temperatures on the horizontal axis, uh, the number of large fires in forest ecosystems is very sensitive to temperature. And so it increases as the temp spring and summer temperatures increase, and then there are nonlinear effects as you pass thresholds, primarily related to timing of the spring snowmelt. So each of these dots shows a large forest fire, at least 1,000 acres or 400 hectares in size in the last few decades in federal forest areas. On the left here, are years with a late cool spring, a late snow melt. Each, a little dot like this would be a thousand acres. A large dot over here, this is half a million acres. It's scaled versus the other dots, not, not versus the, the landscape. So what you see here is that all of the really large forest fires in the western United States in recent decades have occurred in years with an early snow melt, a warm spring. So we can expect that as we increase temperatures, and especially if we don't have dramatic changes in precipitation, that that's going to affect fire going forward. And looking at scenarios for California, the temp there's a range of temperature uh, projections for the future, and the ones that we've used here range from sort of this orange down to, uh, well, B1 PCM. So the bottom and, and mid-range temperature scenarios so are, are what we've used. So one way to get at what is an extreme event for wildfire is just how often do, are we going to, could we see um, uh, what was an extreme event in the past, here defined as a large number of forest fires occurring in the southern Sierra Nevada uh, in July and August. So the green is showing the distribution of, of the number of large forest fires in the southern Sierra Nevada in uh, the historic period. And the red is showing the shift in that distribution uh, under just one projection. So we've, we've modeled about 30,000 future and past scenarios. And for most of those, we didn't save you know, the detailed information about what happened from month to month. So I had to go back to some older models. Uh, but Qualitatively, everything is pretty much the same. So this is just one of those realizations out of the 30,000. But this shift in the distribution of the, lar of the number of large forest fires is showing, you know, on average, an increase of about one fire per summer, per season, uh, comparing the big recent historical experience to, to uh, the end of the 21st century under just one model. But um, the frequency of the most extreme event we had, which was the 1987 fires in, in, uh, in the Sierras, there were 11 in the, in the large fires in the southern Sierra, and that increases 18-fold. The, the frequency of that increases 18-fold by end of century under this, this relatively modest warming scenario. Now here's a drier scenario. Um, 
showing a similar sort of thing, but it's a 40-fold increase for the, um, this extreme event of 11 or more large fires. This kind of shift, you know, if we burn too much, maybe the vegetation is going to be different enough that th these models will no longer be able to describe fire by end of century. But it's just Ill illustrative to give you an idea of how much more sensitive the extremes can be than the mean. Right? So we can, we can look at a lot of different scenarios like this and understand, try to understand what controls that. But this is just looking at fire frequency. Another example would be looking at the size of the fires given that they occur. So in Southern California, the size of the fires, not the frequency, but the size, tends to be driven strongly by the Santa Ana winds. So you can sort of see the smoke from the 2003 fires here. So we have um, uh, Dan Cahan developed uh, Santa Ana wind indices for, for the Southern California. And these green, blue, and red areas show the, the sort of spatial footprint of where we're projecting those, those three indices. And this is showing a typical amount of drying in October by end of century under one of these uh, climate change models. So about a 10% increase in moisture deficit. And these two things drive changes in the size of fires in Southern California by end of century. We can see the shift in the distribution is much more restrained in fire size than it was in fire frequency in the Southern Sierras. But it still translates into an increase of about 40% in the top 1% fire size events by end of century. And it's equivalent to a change in the frequency of Santa Ana winds by about 45%. This change here is just driven by, by the change in moisture. But if you wanted to get back to your original distribution, the original probability of a large fire, you'd have to reduce the Santa Ana wind frequency by 45% to make up for that 10% increase in drying. And it's not, so we've talked about frequency, we've talked about size. Another issue is, is the size of the flame, so flame length and fire line intensity, which has an effect on how you fight the fires and not just how rapidly they spread and, and how big they ultimately get. And the one implication of it is that a current treatment strategies won't be effective as a fire, the flame length and fire line intensity increase as climate warms and dries because um, the gaps that we have to leave in the, in the vegetation won't be adequate. You know, what, what we do now won't be adequate. We'll have to leave larger gaps, a wider treatments, lower fuel t densities in our forests in the future to uh, compensate for these changes in the, uh, the fire intensity, flame length. So looking at just sort of average scenarios, as we warm temperatures, so this leftmost scenario here is showing a model um, that is relatively cool and moist compared to the others. So you're increasing in temperature as you move from left to right and decreasing in, in precipitation as you move from left to right by end of century. Notice the common sort of spatial pattern here, and that's that the biggest increases in area burns. So the darker red it is, the larger percentage increase. If it's a four plus dark red here, it means it was 300% or more increase in the area burned, total area burned, putting together frequency and, and size models for California. So this forests in the Sierras are burning and coast ranges in Southern Cascades are burning more under all of these scenarios. Even the cooler, wetter one, it's an increase of about 100% in area burned across much of the Sierras and over here by more like 300 percent or more. Um, and this has implications for air pollution. So this is showing for several thousand scenarios changes in the uh, total particulate emissions from wildfires in California. Uh, these earlier ones here are um, the historic baseline comparisons and then out here are mid-century with either uh, lower or higher emissions. And this is end of century, but with uh, emissions that tail off and come back down. And this is end of century with, with the A2 emission scenario that's higher emissions here, but, but we've been trending above it uh, in the recent decade. And the thing to keep in mind is just like the 
fire increase in area burned is concentrated in the northern part of the state. Well, so would the increase in uh, emissions. So this is showing CO2 emissions from wildfires under three different scenarios. But it's the same spatial pattern and rate of increase is what you would see with the particulates. And so here's sort of historic uh, emissions. You see it's highest in Southern California and, and some small portions of the Southern Sierra with this low warming. So this is a low emissions, cooler model, PCM B1. Uh, Mid-century, you get a lot more um, fire in the, the Sierras, and then this is a warmer, drier model. End of century, you have a lot more uh, emissions by end of century. So if you're thinking about particulates, all that emissions for particulates, for example, is going to be concentrated in late summer, and it's going to be sitting in the in the Central Valley until the wind changes and takes it away. So we, it's going to be concentrated exposure uh, in terms of who's going to be breathing that stuff. Um, unfortunately, I work there. So, <laughs> um, and, and so we look at a variety of things. One, one thing we look at is, is uh, residential property risks. So how, how under different scenarios would, would uh, vulnerability, economic vulnerability change? So this shows on the left um, for low climate change, on the right high climate change, uh, values at risk in the, in the Bay Area. So the darker red it is, the more value at risk. This going to the second row is uh, adding in higher population growth. So more people in the wildland urban interface give you more value at risk. And down here where is higher population growth and sprawl. So more, more value pushed out into the, the wildland urban interface as well. So I'll stop there. We've got a few minutes still. So.